I'm Tendor. And this is Our Nation, news and analysis on the state of Tibet. Thank you for joining us for episode three, uh, and thank you for all of the feedback. We've had a lot of encouragement online uh, from friends and supporters and people we don't know, saying that the show is actually useful to you, that it's encouraging for you, that it's even, in some cases, helped uh, Tibetans and supporters educate people who are new to the issue, sort of as to where we are now in the movement and the struggle and what the current uh, challenges we face. So it's really great to hear that. Please let us know what you would like us to talk about or or give us feedback, uh, it's really, it is helpful. And we're actually going to talk about three different pieces uh, of news and analysis today. And the first one is this very tragic story uh, from India mm -hmm. in Calcutta of a young Tibetan man uh, who uh, jumped from a bridge in Calcutta into, and, and basically, you know, uh, killed himself. In, and he left behind a note uh, dedicated to Tibetan freedom and with a message to everyone uh, you know, saying that people should dedicate their life to the cause of Tibetan activism and Tibetan freedom. Um, at the same time, you know, uh, his intention and everything uh, is admirable. At the same time, we are very concerned and, you know, we consider this a very tragic moment in terms of um, <coughs> this guy being an activist for a free Tibet. And he's actually known to be somebody who's very active in the movement and uh, and there were many of our friends who have actually had the honor of knowing this person, Tundu Pinzok. Um, and, you know, we really uh, pray for and we wish that all of the Tibetan youth who are out there and every single Tibetan could actually, you know, dedicate their life and not sacrifice their life yeah. for the Tibetan cause. And, you know, we say this with the utmost respect and sensitivity to everybody uh, that we would really love to ensure that everyone can live and dedicate for Tibetan freedom. Yeah, I think that it's clear, um, you know, we don't want to presume to tell anyone what to do, but I, I, we feel like we have to say something because we just don't want to see more Tibetans give their lives up um, in this way when, you know, when actually we need every single person. We need not just every Tibetan who's, who's living now to be engaged daily and living and fighting the struggle as this young man was, but we need more people. We need friends and supporters. We need to increase our numbers around the world. And so far from, we, we can't afford to lose anybody. Yeah. And I really, um, I think we just want to appeal to everybody who watches this show, to Tibetans, to help us engage people and, and you know, the movement, we are making headway. Our struggle is moving forward. There is no need nor time for despair. In fact, despair is a luxury. We have to, every one of us, look at what we can do in our daily lives, what we could do next year and the year after, how we can engage our, engage our friends and families. This is our responsibility and, and we really just want to appeal to people, please, you know, we must live to fight the struggle every day that it takes, every week, every month. Uh, we will get there, but we need all of us, we need every single person, every body, and we need more. We need friends, we need more supporters, and so um, uh, this is the way that we should move forward. Yeah, especially when uh, you happen to be living in exile and in freedom, I think the demands and the burden of freedom are quite different, you know, yeah. just wanted to add that. Yeah, that's, that's <coughs> well put. Um, so just to look at another important story in the news, uh, Trojans target pro-Tibet organizations, another report talking about how um, Chinese online attackers, and we know these are state-sponsored, state-backed, or at least incentivized from the Chinese state, um, Chinese online attackers again going after Tibetans and supporters and not just targeting Windows operating systems, targeting people who use Macs. Now this report, um, it's a trend micro uh, a report, really is quite interesting in that, and I think it's so important people understand this, this, these Trojans, this kind of malware, what it can do when it's in your computer, it can turn, they, it's called remote access Trojan. It's where they, an online attacker, say a, a guy sitting in Shanghai or Beijing or somewhere, he can actually, without you knowing it, control your computer in your home and turn on the camera and turn on the microphone and spy on you, spy on us without us even knowing. Now, 
obviously this is scary and disturbing, but I think there's something that we can all do. First of all, um, we need to educate ourselves how to live in this new online world. We spend hours and hours now, all of us, even our parents and grandparents, online, on Facebook, living in this virtual world, and there's a lot we can do there. At the same time, very few people have had any kind of education or training as to how to be safe and secure while online, while living in this new space. And so I think if you go to TibetAction.net, um, that's our Tibet Action is a is a project of students for a free Tibet. You will find um, a lot of well videos and tools and ways that you can educate yourself and your friends and family to do things like don't click on every attachment, don't open attachments that just come to you. Very often they can be viruses or they can carry malware. Uh, they are designed to look like they're from Tendor, but they're not really from Tendor. We will never send you an attachment, um, but you know. You can detach from attachments, think before you click. We need to, there's, there's actually a lot we can do in this area to, to educate ourselves and then to safeguard ourselves and our communities and certainly our networks and friends and people inside Tibet from being spied on, from being vulnerable in this way. The good news is it's only because Tibet movement is so effective yeah. and Tibetans are <coughs> absolutely um, so such a threat to the Chinese government that they would give us this attention. So there's the good news. Yeah, we are the front lines of this, all these attacks. And, yeah. and also, you know, just because uh, you may not be involved at a full-time level in the movement, don't assume that you're not a target. Absolutely. You know, all of this is relevant to every single person, um, Tibetan and all of our support uh, because we know that uh, simply for forwarding a Tibet related email the Chinese government and hackers have targeted people for doing those actions yeah. uh, so you know everybody is a target and in fact we have a running joke among ourselves saying if you have never received a virus or fake email from Chinese hackers <laughs> that probably means that you haven't yet done enough for Tibet <laughs> so please keep that in mind and behave start behaving and preparing taking these measures as if you are a target because you really are and all, every one of us have been targets of the Chinese uh, hackers. Um, just uh, want to focus on this really important story that must come to light. We are very glad to see Ed Wong of the New York Times uh, in the Sunday Times covering Chinese authorities detaining Tibetan pilgrims, Buddhist pilgrims, when they returned to Tibet. So these were thousands of Tibetans with permission who left Tibet to attend the Kala Chakra teachings of His Holiness the Dalai Lama in India in January. And upon returning to Tibet, we were hearing these stories that literally hundreds and then thousands of Tibetans were being <coughs> rounded up and taken to, well, re-education camps or re-education detention. Uh, I'm sorry, ultimately we have to call this what it is, they, they, they were rounded up and taken to prison camps. Yes. They were held against their will and the Chinese authorities, um, you know, they took, I mean, they took old people, people in their 60s, 70s, 80s, retired people, grandparents, uh, to great distress of these elderly people, many of them, and held <coughs> them uh, basically to we, we were hearing some interesting stories, you know, to educate these people about the law and Chinese laws if they didn't know it. And in some cases, they were being educated about marriage law and tax law. I mean, absolutely ridiculous and outrageous um, behavior by the Chinese government. And, and we really, uh, it's so upsetting and disturbing to mm -hmm. see this happening. Uh, at the same time, I think, you know, Human Rights Watch said in, in a report on this issue, some of these people are still in detention. Yeah. Uh, people were literally disappeared. Human Rights Watch said that they that there had been no such mass kind of roundup of people of Tibetans like this since the 70s. Yeah. Uh, so extremely alarming and disturbing. So, so this, the scale is just mind-boggling. And in fact, uh, you know, for many of the Tibetans who were at the Kala Chakra and uh, many devotees, I think it was a very confusing thing to see a lot of Tibetans coming from Tibet and everybody was wondering uh, how how come the Chinese government may have decided to allow these people to attend and there was this kind of like unsettling feeling you know that this couldn't be true uh, at the same time I think many of our fears have now been proven correct by the fact that the Chinese government has you know detained thousands of people going back from the Kala Chakra mm. and uh, in fact, we've been hearing even worse stories of discrimination against Tibetans. You know, while these detentions are continuing, we've also heard from very close uh, first-hand sources that in Lhasa, the kind of discrimination that are happening over there remind you of apartheid. You know, mm. um, a newborn baby, for example, cannot get a birth certificate or documentation because 
its name is Tenzin. So there's this Which discrimination is, uh, going on against somebody's name being Tenzin because His Holiness's name is Tenzin. Right. And this is just appalling that it's happening in today's world before our own eyes. And it, and it you know, the Chinese government and the authorities, uh, well, of course, people should be absolutely ashamed that the Chinese government is engaged in such activities or behaviors. It's nothing new for Tibetans, but it is. it just shows you, this kind of story is to show you the lengths and the heights that they'll go to to try and control Tibetans but fundamentally, it's safe to say, far from achieving their goals and their aims and objectives, the Chinese government is creating more resistance. They're creating more uh, politicized Tibetans every time they do these things. And certainly in all of the Lhasa area and places where these you know, grandparents and elderly parents and people were detained, they have politicized whole new generations of young people. They may have taken just one grandmother or a set of parents away from a family and imagine all of the ripple effect of those detentions in those people's communities and friends and families, you know, where some people might be more inclined to be less political or to try to stay away from politics or just to keep their head down and try to survive in Tibet today. Uh, now, you know, they're angry, they're upset, they're frustrated, and, and they also can see that the Chinese government has to go. The Chinese authorities, you know, China's occupation of Tibet must end. So, in a way, I don't know, should we thank the Chinese government for doing our job for us in some ways and yeah. in, in how they're solidifying and, and ensuring the future of Tibetan resistance inside Tibet? Yeah. I don't know what they're thinking, but <laughs> I think, you know, all of this is only going to speed up their own downfall. Absolutely. I agree. Um, okay, so that's all for today. Uh, thank you very much for joining us again. This is Our Nation News and Analysis on the State of Tibet. We hope you'll join us for our uh, next episode and take care.